I'm going to talk about the Manville's fire today. The reason I'm doing it is because oh, I first ran across the story probably about uh, 16 years ago. I thought it was fascinating then. I wasn't in the game industry at that point. Um, and quite recently, maybe about a year ago, I reread that story uh, someplace. And I um, got excited about it because I really resonated with it now being in the game industry, and I wanted to share it with, uh, with you guys and see if it's helpful to you at all. Um, just to show hands, is anyone here uh, a leader of a game developer? Good, a few. Uh, leaders of a functional team? Excellent, great, perfect. Okay. Right. Wannabe leaders? Um, so the reason why I think this is useful is Obviously, as leaders of organizations of various sorts, uh, we always have to keep growing, keep improving ourselves. And one of the best ways to do that, in my opinion, is to listen to stories of people who have either succeeded wildly or failed wildly. Put ourselves in their shoes, try to see if we think we could have done better, and what we can take away from that case. And so I think this is a, a perfect one. I don't know who knows the Van Gelch fighter, but it, it uh, occurred in 1949, quite a long time ago. At that time, it was the largest forest fire disaster the nation had ever seen. The uh, consequences of it uh, were long lasting. They put immediate funding into scientific research of fires to try to understand how fires operate uh, in different terrains and geographies and with different fuels. Uh, and put a science behind it. They also changed their safety protocols because of known improvement perished in this, in this uh, disaster. Thank you very much. OK, great. So first, let me introduce you to Mang Gulch. So Mang Gulch is uh, it's in central Montana. It's a couple of valleys over uh, from Gates of the Mountains. Uh, which was uh, discovered by Lewis. Uh, it's remote. It runs uh, into the Missouri River, which you can kind of see here, and there's a little tourist boat. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's very remote. Uh, it's also a boundary of sorts because there's forest. There's the great kind of forest of, uh, of, central, of the central part of America, of the Midwest. And then there's the plains, which you find in Kansas and beyond, and it's kind of a it's kind of a boundary between those two things, the forest and plain, and it becomes important later in the story. Uh, so August fifth, nineteen forty nine, uh, it was late in the season. Obviously, it had been a very dry season. Fire danger was high. This is very timely if you live in Washington or if you listen to the news. You have a number of fires raging in a very dry season here as well. Um, and uh, lightning struck in the afternoon. Most fires in the country actually do happen in the afternoon because you have thunder showers and it comes with lightning, and lightning generally starts fires. So a fire was detected right around here in the lit in this ridge between Van Gulch and Merriweather Gulch or Canyon. Uh, it was a slow burning fire, probably contained within 40 to 50 acres. Uh, so not a huge alarm. Nonetheless, they were going to uh, send a group of smoke jumpers to go fight that fire and try to put it out by the next day before it could become anything else. Uh, by the end of this story, it will have burned about 4,500 acres or more. So. C-47. So. Uh, about 1941, they first started smoke jumping. Uh, and uh, they would smoke jump out of these C-47 planes. Uh, a group of guys would basically go and trust their lives to a pilot, who, and a pilot and a spotter, and the leader of the team, who would generally try to figure out where the landing zone should be uh, in the middle of the fire. So it turns out that the first guy that actually ever jumped and did smoke jumping was the spotter on this plane that took these guys to Van Gulch that day. Uh, so the crew itself, leader smoke jumpers, the crew itself was led by a man named Wagner Dodge, uh, the best name ever. <laughs> Wagner Dodge was described as fastidious, 
Uh, remarkable with his hands. He was very talented maintenance guy uh, and artistically. Uh, he was very quiet, didn't talk a lot, didn't communicate a lot. Uh, but he was a thinker and he was very experienced. He had nine years of jumping and firefighting experience. So uh, he was 33 years old at the time uh, and technically was definitely the most experienced guy in the crew. Uh, as far as the crew itself, interesting things you should know about smoke jumpers. So they tend to be young. They're paid by the hour. Uh, they like to be paid overtime, so fires tend to last about 12 hours. Because uh, they can put them out in 10, but why, why 10 when you can do 12? Uh, they tended, in this case, to be between uh, 17 and 23 years old. 17 was illegal at that time, uh, but the guy lied about his age. Most of these guys, uh, there were 15 of them in all, uh, most of these guys uh, had jumped out of planes before professionally because they were uh, former uh, military. They had fought in World War II. Some of these guys were students, uh, and other guys were just people trying to make money for the summer. Just so you have a sense of what you're jumping into, you've got nylon parachutes, and you're leading a team of people into something like this. Right? So you would expect that this kind of work is done by a unit, by a uh, a leader who knows his team, and the team knows each other, and they have a definite uh, culture. But this is not the case in the Forest Service, and certainly not at that time. Uh, the way that you determine who is on a crew is uh, you determined it by who had been away from a fire the longest. Right. So these guys were kind of randomly mixed and matched all summer long. Some of them had worked together, some of them had not. And none of them knew Wagner Dodge, because Wagner was so good with his hands that he had actually missed, he'd skipped the three week training where all the guys kind of got to know each other. And so they'd seen him around, they'd heard of him as a little bit of a legend, but they never talked to him. And he wasn't very talkative, right? Uh, a couple things I should probably say about fire, since I have this chart up, or this page up. So um, most fire, who's fought fire, like forest fire in this room? Yes. <laughs> got one. Anyone else? So I actually grew up fighting forest fires because we set a fire every year around my property in Georgia. Uh, and I was I was a red card holder as well. Can you tell me about your experience? Uh, Nevada National Guard. Nice. Did you fight a lot of fires? Um, three seasons. Uh, you know, usually it's portals, but um, in and around it. Do you do mop up or do you try to actually break the fires? Both. Um, you know, a lot of logistical resupply, and um, so it was communications, it was uh, bringing water, food, yep. um, basic transport, uh, heavy equipment, sometimes we had uh, bulldozers, whatever, uh, some of our heavier movers, wreckers to get things out of yep. uh, places, so a lot of the stuff around the periphery of it, we were all basically trained for fighting fires and also for dealing with evacuation of things when things got out of hand and that kind of thing. This will be interesting for you. Yeah, yeah, that's why I'm um, So most fires are actually contained at the ground level, right, uh, when they start. And, uh, and so you can you try to put them out, but basically creating a fire break. You know, right? So you've got these uh, Pulaski axes that are kind of like a hoe and an axe combined, and you're digging a trench, and you're exposing minerals, so you've got no fuel for the fire to jump, uh, and then kind of people come behind you and widen out that ditch. And then, uh, and then in mop-up work, for example, sometimes you're sawing down trees and you're just try, basically trying to eliminate fuel. Uh, and if you do that in advance, you do it fastidiously for a number of hours, you can break a lot of the fires. The danger is when uh, a fire goes into the crown of the trees, conditions become favorable for some kind of a blow-up, right? Uh, and, uh, and then everything can go bad. And when things go bad, there's no reason to die, so you try to get yourself and your men Uh, the other thing I'll note is, this is a silent slide. When you're actually in a fire, what does a fire sound like? Oh my god, it sounds like a train. I mean, it's, a, it's loud, the wind, the crackling, the things, the trees exploding. I mean, you know, it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just this 
overwhelming omnipresent, the heat, the pressure, the, yeah. It's a great way to explain it. I mean, it sounds a lot like a train bearing down on you from behind. It's scary. Uh, this is a, this is an overhead of, uh, of Man Gulch. Uh, and so you see Merriweather Canyon, you see Rescue Gulch, ironically named. The LZ was right around here, spot 11. So they went around and around several times trying to find a safe landing zone. Uh, they would like to have had it a little bit closer to the fire, but it was deemed too risky because there was too much turbulence of wind here on the ridge, which is pretty uh, common. And so they decided on, on 11, they did a number of passes and four men jumped at a time, then they dropped their cargo, uh, and basically by 3.30, they had completed their jump. Right? Or no, it was more like 4.30. Uh, and then it took them about 30 minutes to put away their parachutes, get their backpacks on, get their equipment in hand, uh, and, uh, and then Wagner Dodge told his, uh, his second in command, a guy named Hellman, who had uh, been a veteran in World War II, was actually a pretty well known uh, jumper uh, nationally, uh, to go take the, the group and take the team and take them to point 12 right in the gulch uh, and eat their last meal uh, and take their last break because they're going to be working all night. Right? And hopefully they'll be done by 10 in the morning. Meanwhile, they heard someone kind of calling out on a ridge. So Wagner Dodge decided to leave them in, and he went to spot four to go find that person. And that person turned out to be an ex-smoke jumper who had quit the year before because his mom thought it was too dangerous. Uh, and he was a ranger here in Merriweather Canyon. He was one of the first guys to spot the fire. And so uh, and uh, he decided he would go and try to do what he could. And, he was trying to put out the fire a little bit, do some brake work right there in spot four when they caught up to him. So Wagner and, and he actually looked, walked around a bit and looked at the fire. It was still contained right about here relatively, but the wind was picking up. Uh, and Wagner Dodge was concerned because the wind was blowing in from the mouth towards them. And so he didn't want to be caught in that kind of situation. So what he wanted to do was try to take the men down the gully position themselves right around here and fight the fire from here, where they always had the safety of the river they could go into, right, if things got bad. So he went back to position 12. The men were ready at this point. Uh, and he said to, uh, he had forgotten his own route, so he said to Hillman, why don't you walk to this place, position 5. I'm going to go back to the LZ, and I'm going to go get some food. So he did. Uh, and so the men walked for about 20 miles, uh, for 20 minutes, uh, and they, uh, the second in command has a very difficult job. Anyway, uh, the group of about 15 men uh, broke into two groups accidentally and kind of got lost, and they were separated by about 500 yards at one point, and it took a little while um, for them to kind of know where each group was, but finally Dodge caught up to them about 20 minutes later reassembled the group right here at point five. Uh, then he took them up gully, away from the fire a bit, to about point six, and then they were going to kind of make their way down here. At point six, he had his second realization of the day that was negative. The first was that the wind was picking up and headed towards them. The second was that basically a number of, uh, because the wind had picked up and was going this way, uh, there was a number of kind of whirlwind type activity going on at the mouth of the gully, and what it had done is taken pine cones and embers and such, and it had effectively lit four or five other fires right in front of them. So there was no way of blocking them from going to the river. There was no way that these guys could get to the river. He saw that. Now in this whole period, man, Wagner Dodge had not said a word to his man. He was just in the front, and then he saw this. And he was probably internally freaking out, right, as anyone would. And then he turned around. And he turned all his people around without saying a word. Uh, and at this point, I'm sure the group was uh, a little bit scared and pretty per perplexed. Uh, one, they really wanted to fight this fire. That's what smoke trappers do. They really wanted to attack it from the front. But I had ordered them basically to fight it from the rear. They were a little demotivated by it. We can do that. That's fine. But then 
what the hell? He's backing us back. Like, why are we doing that? And so then, Wagner starts moving from 6.7. He's clearly trying to go over the ridge, right? At 0.7, he has his third uh, terrible understanding of the day, which is, oh, and I should mention, they, their radio broke during the jump, and they forgot to bring a map. Uh, but, and so they did not know, no one knew this terrain very well. So at 0.7, what uh, Wagner discovered was that the forest gave way to prairie, or prairie grass. So this was a dry, grass plane that he was coming into. So when you're fighting a forest fire, even if there's blow up, most of the time it's traveling four or five miles an hour. You can outrun it in a forest. But when you get to the plains and the wind is, un wind is unimpeded by, by trees, what do you think happens? Right? The fire overtakes you. It goes faster than any person can hope to run. Right? So they're coming into that. At, uh, around this point, he says to the guys, a little bit before this point seven, he said to the guys, without trying to incite alarm, you should drop your packs. You should drop your equipment. Uh, this basically is abandonment of the mission, right, at this point. This is saving yourself. It's a signal. Uh, and, uh, and he was surprised to find that half of the men already had. They didn't wait for him, right? Uh, and the other half actually refused to do it. Because they might need those tools, right? If they need, got into a bad situation, which they already were. Uh, and so they were going single file, some of them with packs and heavy equipment, some of them without, following Wagner Dodge. And about, uh, at about 5.55, so they dropped about 5.50 right here. 5.55, they're at 0.8 on the map. Wagner Dodge looks, he can see that the ridge is about 200 yards away totally up the gorge, right? They're not going to make it because the fire is going to catch the, the guys at the back of his line in 90 seconds, right? So hopeless, they can't make that ridge. So what does he do? He stops. He takes a, he takes a match from a book that he had, he drops it on the ground. And then that match catches fire rapidly and uh, it spreads out in a circle. He hops over the circle, into the fire, right? Into the fire circle that is burned out. And then he waits a few seconds and he signals for the second and third guy to join him in this burned out circle. Wagner Dodge didn't know it at the time, but he had invented what is now called the escape fire. This is also a standard protocol. If you get into trouble, it's one of the tools in your toolkit. A whole fire fire with fire tool. Right? Now, the men on his team, no one had ever encountered an escape fire. Wagner just invented it. They thought he was doing a backfire, right? A last minute effort, but that's, there's, no, there's no time for a backfire to work, right? Uh, and also, he could very well just go in advance and kill the whole team, right? So they thought that uh, Wagner Dodge had clearly lost his mind. Right? And so what did number, guy number two and number three do? Guy number two is a guy named uh, Sal, uh, Sally, and uh, a guy number three was a guy named Rumsey. They happened to be roommates all summer long, uh, and they were very close, and they were the youngest guys in the team, 17, 18, respectively. They just made a break for it. They ran. They ran as far and as fast as they could. In case you're wondering, point eight is equivalent to this. If any of you have ever tried to run up a ridge really quickly, you know how impossible this is. So yeah, two healthy young guys scared out of their minds know each other, might make it, but probably unlikely. At least they're at the head of the pack. Think of all the people behind these three. So, uh, so then number two and number three skip. They leave Wagner Dodge. Everybody else follows. You know, Wagner is signaling to them, the fire circle is getting bigger and bigger, there's a burned out space, and through the smoke, and with all the noise, he can't really communicate, but he's signaling, come here, join me here. They're looking back at the fire you just saw a picture of, and they're like, oh, no. <laughs> and they run, right? Because the training and the instinct that you have is to run to a ridge and try to save yourself. That's what they taught that summer anyway. If you're in, in trouble, try to get to a ridge. But fire can go over a ridge, but it's something. 
So, uh, in fact, Hellman is number two. When I got to Hellman, uh, Dodge later testified that he heard Hellman say, to hell with you, I'm getting out of here. And he ran. Exactly one minute later, according to the, uh, the melted face of a, of a wristwatch belonging to one of the smoke jumpers, uh, the fire overtook the crew and killed everybody. Except it didn't kill Wagner Dodge. He survived in his fire escape circle. Uh, he was actually lifted up by the wind that was going over him from the fire three times. That's how strong it was. Uh, but in the end, he survived relatively unscathed. Uh, Sally and Rumsey made it to a rocky crevice, jumped in, and similar to Dodge, survived. Uh, right nearby, Hellman, the number two guy, uh, was found uh, unfortunately charred and he died the next day. But he was alive, he had a few words and then he died the next day. Uh, and then there was one other person who was badly burned and he died the next day. So out of the 16, if you include the ranger from Meriwether Canyon, who was the first to die because he was the least in shape and he gave up halfway through the retreat. Um, Basically, you lost, you saved three, and 13 men died. It was the largest tragedy of the time, and made everybody rethink how we treat ourselves. So, Wagner Dodge. Uh, my point is not to beat up on Wagner Dodge. Like, he was facing some incredible odds, right? Nobody, he didn't know this team. He had never worked with them. They weren't a team. They're just a collection of individuals who did the same thing. They had a little bit of group identity, but they didn't know each other. They didn't trust each other. But let's think about what he is. He's a somewhat older guy. He's 33 with a, a lot of experience. And he's leading a team of guys, 17 to 23, with less experience. He's technically competent. He doesn't talk a lot. He's very authoritarian, right? Uh, and his own team had said he was hard to, it was hard to know what he was thinking. Because actually, his own wife said, I loved him, but I really didn't know him well. Uh, so he was that quiet. When I think about it, I think about a lot of game developers. Right? I mean, how many, how many functional teams and how many game development studios are run by people not too dissimilar from Wagner Dodge? Right? Um, could you give us an example? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you? <laughs> Game attorney. Look, uh, you know, so I actually spent the whole summer telling this story to various CEOs of Game Studios, and I was kind of looking for their reaction. What did they see in the story? What did they pick up in the story? Did it resonate with them? And it resonated with a lot of them, uh, and for different reasons. Um, but I'll give you a few things that, to chew on and you can get out of it what you would like. But uh, I think to me it shows that you know, leadership matters most when you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. When your company is funded, when you have a project that you're working on and the journalists are excited about it, right? nobody's going to challenge your leadership. No one's going to not do what you ask them to do. Right? It's exactly when you lose funding when your publisher bails on you, when everybody disses your game, right? If people wonder, does this guy really know what he's doing, right? And so what it means is that leadership uh, is to a good extent also about preparation. It's about preparing for those moments of leadership you're going to encounter, and you have to prepare during periods of normalcy, when things are good. And that's what you don't often think about, right? Oh yes, so in case you're wondering why is he talking about this fire story, if you still don't get it, to me, the terrain is the opportunity and the obstacles that we all have in the game industry, right? To make our dollar, to make our living, to have some fun. The fire, it's the market forces, it's the competition that we face, right? It's the dynamics of the industry that are challenging us, right? Right? And you're running a team, and that team is fighting the fire for Earth, for opportunity. It, 
also tells me this whole story that uh, to have a vision isn't enough. You know, Wagner Dodge did a good job. Like, as a leader, one of the most important things, the first thing you have to do is you're not necessarily in the trenches to the same extent that the rest of your team is. And so as a result, your job is to make sure you have perspective, right? You maintain perspective, you look at the big picture, and then you create a vision that is compelling and it's achievable, but it's also difficult. It's challenging. And you have to sell that vision, right? But to just have a vision, to know what the overall is, to understand, oh, the fire is dangerous, we should position ourselves near the river, and then just guide your people without telling them, that's not enough. Wagner Dodge invented the escape fire. Think about it. 90 seconds left to go, he invented the perfect thing to save him and potentially his entire team, right? The perfect idea at the right time. How many of us have that, right? The perfect idea that we believe in. But just to have that is not enough. You'll still fail. You can still fail. Because the soft skills and preparation for those moments of leadership are important. That matters. By soft skills, I mean all the mushy stuff, right? Communication, building credibility and trust, establishing a company culture. Why are these things important in a situation like Wagner Dodge? It's in an ideal world. Communication, because obviously you have to have a, a vision, you have to communicate it, and you have to make people believe in it, right? Uh, and more than that, it has to come back up at you. And one thing Wagner didn't do, and this wasn't the era for that, and maybe it's more of the era today. He didn't use this team. If you go through that story, you go through all the testimony, like he didn't use the team for anything. He just kind of brought the team with him. Every decision he made, he made by himself. But every one of us is a very powerful processor of information. We all have insights, things we can share. And he didn't use that or leverage that. Credibility, credibility. So. Some people are just uh, talented, natural born leaders, right? I don't know if you know Peter Moore. But Peter Moore is like the most charming guy in the games industry uh, and is a natural leader. I worked for him when he led the entertainment division for Microsoft. Uh, he works at EA now, EA Sports. Uh, and I like to believe that Peter Moore could probably have talked me into that circle, even if I'd only met him an hour ago. But the rest of us probably couldn't. We have to build credibility, we have to build trust, and we have to engender and foster trust within the team, right? Uh, because, think about it, if Wagner Dodge had had even one ally, if he had made Sally an ally, just from casual conversation on that plane, and Sally had decided not to run past him, but to join him in the fire, do you think that the third person, his roommate, would have come? And the fourth person, and the fifth, right? Sometimes, in moments of challenge, credibility and having one single ally is what can save And then culture. So here's the thing. The more experienced you are at a thing, when you encounter stress, the further your performance will take you. So the more stress, the higher your performance. And then at some point, it's so stressful, your performance falls off the cliff. That's the way it is for all of us. But the more experienced you are, the further to the right that performance curve will go. Right? But when you have younger people on the team that are less experienced than you, the thing that will take your performance as a team to the right-hand side is actually having a sense of group identity, right? a shared set of values, uh, and, and, an ability, and an open communication system that allows experience to be imparted. And so whatever that is, you know, however you build a culture, uh, it's, it's important, and it's not something that you kind of relegate to after you finish your game, right? So whether that's wine o'clock, which it is on our team, on Fridays, or you know, or uh, retro game Thursdays, or game jams, or whatever cultural uh, bits of identity you infuse your team with, it's important. And so uh, that's the story of Mango. That's some things that you could think about. I'm sure that you all see your own things in it. I'd love to hear what you see. Uh, but I've gotten a five minute warning, and that is my talk today. Thank you very much. If you want to hear more about Mangels, these are excellent, so well written. The guy uh, that 
said, uh, what is it? Uh, a river runs through it, if you know that book. He wrote this fantastic read, and this is an amazing book on leadership by a former professor of mine. 